I love being here to study the Word of God together. It makes it a great day for me. I hope it does for you as well. One of the um, things I'd love to watch on the news, and sometimes um, I go to YouTube and watch them as well, are the videos that capture the reunion between a military mom and dad and their family. And one of the best I've seen, which I watched it a couple of times, was of this young high school guy, um, football player, and he's standing on the sidelines all decked out in his pads and his helmet and his football uniform, and the mascot of the high school is standing next to him. Um, And all of a sudden, um, the mascot takes off his headpiece. And of course, it's the boy's dad, returned from months of deployment. And it, it takes a minute for this cute football player to really catch on to what is going on here. But the video captured it so perfectly. It captured every emotion on this kiddo's face. First, he was shocked. He was like, what is really happening here? Why are you taking off your headpiece? And then there was disbelief like, what? That can't really be who I think it is. And then there was wonder and joy. And finally, just the tears of relief that his dad was home and out of harm's way. There wasn't a dry eye in the stadium on that video, even the coaches were just sobbing alongside the football team. Uh, As we head back to Matthew today, we're not going to talk about football, but we are going to start with one of the most famous passages in all of the scriptures, and that is Jesus walking on the water. Don't you wish there was a YouTube video? Don't you wish we could just see that? We could think, oh my gosh, it's really him. Look, the wind and the waves. And then we would be able to see the shock and the disbelief and the wonder and the joy. And finally, the relief from the disciples is they think, oh my goodness, that is Jesus. No matter who you are, An encounter with the Son of God opens your eyes to the truth of who He is, and it changes your life. So everybody turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, and let's find out what it means when Jesus says, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And we're going to start in the middle today at verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, so the wind was against him. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, after hearing the news of John the Baptist's death, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, and seeing Jesus' incredible miracles that he had been performing all over the region of Galilee, the Jewish crowds had begun searching for him because they have decided if he's the Messiah, we're going to force him into being king. He is going to take up his kingdom and release us from rulership in Rome. So they are searching for him to make him forcibly the king of Israel. But the leaders of Israel have rejected him, haven't they? We've seen this. We saw it last week when they called his miracles acts of Satan. And the leaders of Israel have begun plotting against him. And because of that, Jesus' kingdom and his kingship His millennial kingdom are going to be postponed. They're going to be postponed. Now, because Jesus knows his own disciples are probably pretty thrilled that the crowds are wanting to make him king, 
That's in their head too, that he's going to assume an earthly kingship over Israel. Jesus diffuses the situation here, and um, he does what any good leader would do. He sends the crowds away. He makes the disciples get in the boat and leave so that they're not together plotting against him. And then he seeks out a quiet place to spend some time with his father. Look at what John records in his gospel in John 6, 14 and 15 about this time in Jesus' life. When the people saw the signs that he had done, they said to him, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew to the mountain by himself. Now, Jesus stays up on this mountain until somewhere between 3 and 6 in the morning, and it's still dark, and there is a storm which has kept the disciples from landing on the other side of the lake where he'd sent them to. And these poor guys have rowed against this storm all night long, and suddenly in the midst of their struggle, they look out hoping to find relief from the storm And what they see is not Jesus walking around the edge of the lake looking for them. What they see is Jesus walking right straight towards them on the water. Walking towards them on the water. Now, um, they're exhausted. They're probably wondering if they're going to die in this storm. So it's not really unusual that they would immediately think, this is a ghost, our demise is near, and this ghost has come for us. Jesus doesn't make them wait and wonder because the second he hears that, he immediately calls out to them these incredible words which hold great truth. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now the Greek word here used in the phrase take heart that Jesus calls out to them means to have courage, to have confidence, and even comfort. In fact, some of your Bible translations may say take courage. I know some of them even say be of good cheer. That's surrounding this uh, um, thought of courage, confidence, and comfort. Um, The words he uses here to identify himself when he says our English translations say it is I are actually the exact same words that God used to identify himself to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus. They're the exact same words that Jesus uses in the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers come to arrest him. Look at John 18.6 on your verse sheet. When Jesus said to them, I am he... They drew back and fell to the ground. That was him speaking to the soldiers. And the power of these words, I am he in Gethsemane, actually physically throw those soldiers to the ground. In the Greek, these words are literally the name of God, translated I am. And when Jesus speaks these words to the disciples as he walks towards them on the water, He's giving himself an identity, isn't he? He's identifying himself to them without a shadow of a doubt. He's speaking that he is God incarnate. He's the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Now, as Jesus speaks here, Peter, our great Peter, has an incredible moment. Now, just like the rest of the disciples, he has been gripped in fear. But he makes a great choice here, even in the midst of his fear. You know, we always talk about Peter being the impulsive disciple that does things. But I don't see Peter really being impulsive here. He doesn't just see Jesus and jump over the side of the boat. He does an interesting thing. First, he says to Jesus, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, this phrase, if it is you doesn't display doubt on Peter's part because probably in our culture it is better translated since it is you or because it is you. That's really the meaning of these words here. And it's not really crazy that Peter asked Jesus to command him to do a miracle, which would be to walk on the water just like Jesus is doing. Because Jesus had previously given the disciples the power to do miracles. Look at Matthew 10 on your verse sheet and this is Jesus saying to the disciples and proclaim as you go saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick raise the dead cleanse the lepers cast out demons 
So, when Peter gets the command from Jesus, who says, come, he makes a choice. And Peter's choice is to let go of his fear and this crazy situation, the wind and the waves and the storm and this man walking on the water. He chooses faith. He chooses faith. And then he gets out of the boat. You know, as I've studied this, I don't really think the hard part was getting out of the boat. I think the hard part was first choosing faith. Choosing faith in the midst of a crazy storm, as Peter does here, really is an incredible act of discipline. An incredible act of discipline. Because faith is not an emotion, is it? Faith is not an emotion. It's a disciplined choice in all of our lives and every situation that we face. It was probably 15 years or so ago, we had a women's retreat speaker by the name of Nay Bailey, a great, great gal. And Nay had written a, ba- a book called Faith is Not a Feeling. And it was a thought that so resonated with me at the time when we had Nay come and speak. Because in the midst of every storm in my life, faith was never the emotion that washed over me first. The feeling that comes to most of us and most often in the midst of a crisis is fear, isn't it? We feel fear immediately when we first hear the words cancer or divorce. So we get that phone call that says someone we love has been in a terrible accident. But there is a key here for us, something for us to learn. The key for us to be able to do what Peter does here, which is choose faith over fear in the midst of a terrible storm, is actually found in Jesus' own words to the disciples. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Because what Peter chooses here is to believe the words of Jesus, to believe the words of Jesus and his courage and his confidence and even his comfort come from believing that Jesus is the Son of God. When Jesus says, I am, Peter's heart gets it. And as he believes the Son of God, he recognizes that the Son of God has authority in heaven and on earth. And Peter believes that he could do anything if it is Christ's will for him. The storm that has terrified Peter is still there, but he chooses faith. He makes that disciplined choice and he believes the words that Jesus speaks to him. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Look at Philippians 4.13 on your verse sheet. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Peter personifies Paul's verse here. Now we don't know how long or how far Peter actually got as he walked on the water before he looked around and thought, Oh no, my disciplined choice of faith has me out here in the midst of these waves and the storm. What am I doing out here defying nature in the midst of a terrible storm? And when he does, stop listening to the words of Jesus and start looking at the storm. Then his fear rises up again and his faith fails him at the worst moment and he begins to sink. Um, But Peter has another great moment here even as his faith fails him because even in the midst of sinking, what does he do? He chooses faith again. He calls out to Jesus. Um, I would have been screaming hysterically, help me, I'm drowning. But he calls out the name of Jesus, Lord, save me. And when he does, Jesus, because he is the Son of God, reaches out his hand and saves him immediately. Now, he does give Peter a slight rebuke here and comments on his shrinking faith. um, Because I think in Jesus' mind... Um, it would have been uh, a better choice for Peter's faith to have lasted until they both got into the boat. Um, Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that situation would have been like um, to stop as you're sinking and call out the name of Jesus and believe that he is the Son of God? A friend of mine tells the story of last spring. She was out working in her garden and she tripped and fell and landed right on her elbow and broke her elbow and she was alone at the house at her at the time and she hadn't thought to take her phone out in the backyard with her and as she 
laid there after falling, she looked down at how disfigured her arm immediately was. And she told me later that when she saw her arm and how bad it looked that she called out the name of Jesus. She said, Jesus, have mercy on me. And after she did that, she was able to get herself up and get in the house and get to her phone and call for help. Fear is the emotion that strikes first in any storm. Faith is the disciplined choice of those who recognize that Jesus is the Son of God and believe what he says. You know, Jesus' powerful words in this story, um, which I've probably read and overlooked many times, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Answer a great question. They answer the question for the disciples and for us of who Jesus is. And Peter's actions answer the question for us of what do we do when we know who Jesus is. We can have the courage to choose faith over fear when we recognize who he is and believe the words he speaks to us. Now, the rest of chapters 14 and 15 are also filled with amazing stuff, and they help us recognize and believe that Jesus is the Son of God as well. Let's start back at the top of chapter 14 at verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch had heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Now, this Herod here is actually the son of Herod the Great, who 30 years older was was killing all the babies that he thought might be Jesus. Um, It's not a great family um, history here, is it? Uh, This Herod is actually the current ruler over Galilee. He's been appointed by the Romans. He's not a Jew. He has an Edomite background. But he's been intrigued with John the Baptist and his message Um, to the people of Israel. He's probably called John in and had some private meetings with him and asked him questions and heard more about John's message of repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he has some fear of John and some sense in his spirit you can tell that John is a man of God. But when John goes against Herod and condemns his marriage to his brother's wife, Herodias, um, Herod has him thrown in jail. That's what Herodias wants, and that's what Herod does. Now, I think Herod would probably like to get rid of John altogether because Herodias is giving him so much trouble about John, but he's afraid to do that because he knows the Jews might rise up and cause trouble with him in Rome. Now, if we were to take time to read through the rest of this story carefully, we would see how wrong this whole thing is. It is just wrong from start to finish, isn't it? These are drunk men here that are at a party. They're watching a 14, 15-year-old girl probably dance pretty suggestively before them. And this teenager has been set up by her own mother um, to ask for someone to be murdered. Um, and that's, real, that's what happens here at the end of the story. And we don't see any remorse or revulsion from this teenager or from Herodias, her mother, when that's actually what happens when John the Baptist's head is delivered to them on a serving platter. Look at verse 10 with me in chapter 14. He sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Now, this is an unfortunate example of a terribly evil mother teaching her daughter to be terribly evil as well. Herod probably thinks this is the end of the story. I've gotten rid of John. We can move on here. But then he begins to hear what's happening with the crowds and with Jesus and the miracles. And his guilty conscience convinces him that it is John resurrected performing those miracles. Now, that redeeming part of this terrible story to me is that even though these evil, evil people have ended John's life as the herald of the coming Messiah, an innocent man who did not deserve uh, what they dished out to him, 
These evil people may have ended John's life, but they haven't stopped the Messiah, have they? God's plans always follow through. Jesus' fame is spreading. That's why the Herod has heard about him. Jesus is doing miracles and teaching the gospel wherever he goes. Can you hear Jesus' words here? Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid because evil exists in the world Evil may wreak havoc on innocent lives. But Jesus still reigns, doesn't he? Jesus still reigns because he is the Son of God. So when we look around our world today, we can remember what the disciples fell to the floor of that boat and testified to that night in their terrible storm. Jesus is the Son of God. And we can take courage and comfort and confidence in knowing that Jesus will not be stopped and his work continues even when evil exists. Okay, let's read some more together. Look at verse 13 with me. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. And when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns and he went ashore. To, uh, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. The day is now over. Send the crowds away and go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We only have five loaves here and two fishes. And he said, Bring them here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish He looked up to heaven and said a blessing and then he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken leftover pieces. Now, following John's death, Jesus uh, began to gear his ministry more towards teaching and training his disciples. This is only about... 18 months to a year before the crucifixion, Jesus knows the timeline and he knows I need to be building into these men. And what he does here is he travels outside the reach of Herod to Bethsaida where Philip the Tetrarch rules. But before he finds that quiet place that he's looking for to teach and train his disciples and continue to prepare them for what's coming, he's swarmed by people that really are desperate for his healing and his compassion. And in his compassion, Jesus not only heals their physical um, needs, but he also addresses their spiritual needs. And we see that in the account of this in the other Gospels, actually. Um, They ask Jesus, uh, but by the end of the day, the disciples are done. They have had it, um, and they ask... uh, Jesus for a break here. They, they ask him for the only solution that they can come up with in their minds and faced with these 5,000 people. And I would have said the exact same thing. And they say, let's send the crowds away to the nearest town to buy food. But Jesus has another idea because he's ready for the disciples to begin to feel the burden of shepherding. The burden of shepherding on their own and not simply to be walking around with him as spectators to his shepherding because he knows that they are going to eventually shoulder all the load for shepherding after his death. Look at John 21 on your verse sheet. When they had finished breakfast, the disciples said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. And he goes on and says that to Peter two more times until down at the very bottom, look at the last line there. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus knows the disciples' future. He knows the disciples' future, and he's ready for them to learn that ministry and shepherding and taking care of lost sheep is more than simply being his shadow. Um, Shepherding the sheep in the future would mean taking whatever they had available to them and bringing it to the Lord so that he could provide what was needed. And that's what they walk through here. They come up with five loaves and two fishes, which 
I'm kind of shocked that's all they came up with in the midst of probably nine or 10,000 people, but that's what they had. And because of the fact that they brought it to Jesus, it becomes everything they need and more for probably about 10,000 people by the time they count in their um, wives and their children. Uh, they give it to the Lord for his blessing. Now, if this was the only story in Scripture of God's supernatural provision, we could probably pass it off as an anomaly of when Jesus walked physically on the earth. But if you think about the scriptures, God provides for his people over and over again, doesn't he? God provided for the nation of Israel by sending Joseph ahead of them into Egypt before the famine. He, and then he provided for them with manna and water and every other single thing they needed in the wilderness. He provided oil and flour for the widow of Zarephath and, and her son, he provided an earthquake for Paul in prison, didn't he, when he needed to be released. We could spend the rest of the week talking about God's provision for his people. Because Jesus is the Son of God, we can depend on him to provide whatever we need when we do his work. You know, it's never how much we have. It's never how much we have. How much money, how many workers, how much wisdom, how many loaves or fishes. It's how much we trust him with what we have that accomplishes ministry in his name. That's the lesson here for the disciples. How much do you trust me with what you have when you need to feed the sheep? When faced with ministry, big or small, we should hear Jesus' words and believe them because he is the Son of God. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Even when you have 10,000 hungry people, five loaves and two fishes, now, chapter 15 um, continues with the attack of the Jewish leaders on Jesus. Look at chapter 15, verse 1 with me. The scribes and the Pharisees came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. Now, these scribes and Pharisees have come all the way from Jerusalem to attack Jesus, and that shows you how powerful the opposition to Jesus really was, uh, because now they're traveling to come after him. And what Matthew describes here is simply the transgression of ritual hand washing before eating. Now, Mark's gospel goes a little further into detail, and he talks about the ritual washings of the plates and the cups and the pots and even the ceremonial dining couches that had to be purified before they ate. So the accusation in these verses is really not about hand washing as far as the Pharisees are concerned with Jesus. The accusation in these verses is about Jesus disregarding Jewish ceremonial law, the traditions that have been added upon tradition centuries after centuries um, of the nation of Israel. Jesus does not get into a little argument with them about the tradition here. What he does is bypass all that ceremonial tradition stuff and he goes, um, that he's accused of omitting, and he really goes to the heart of the matter, which is the heart of the Pharisees. He challenges their commitment to these rituals by pointing out their own lack of commitment to God's commands in the Ten Commandments. And he specifically points out the commandment um, to honor their father and their mother because they had, over the centuries, put in place man-made traditions that kept parents and families for, from being cared for simply because they had dedicated funds to the temple after their death. They were standing there talking to Jesus about the tradition of hand-washing, and he was looking straight into their hearts. 
He was looking straight into their hearts. And Jesus knows the truth about human hearts, doesn't he? We can't um, run away or disguise or throw up some kind of smoke screen when it comes to Jesus. Because Jesus knows that it is sin that comes straight out of our hearts. It doesn't have anything to do with what we put into our mouths at mealtime. Because it's our hearts that need cleansing every moment of the day. And Jesus is not going to stand there and talk to them about washing hands when he knows that it's our hearts that God examines when we claim to be his people. Not our eating habits. Not our pots and pans. Can you imagine going to God and having him say, you didn't load the dishwasher this morning. Sorry. Um, yeah, that is exactly what Jesus says here. It's not our pots and pans that we need to be worried about, people. It's our hearts. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah in verse 8. Look at that with me. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as the doctrines, the commandments of men. Sadly, sadly, even the disciples have difficulty grasping the cover up here. That the Pharisees want to cover up a heart that harbors sin by camouflaging it with this distracting layer of legalism and rituals. And after they've heard the discussion that Jesus has with the Pharisees, they get a little bit nervous and anxious. Nervous and anxious enough to actually go to Jesus and, and say, we're afraid you've offended the rule-following Pharisees. But look at what Jesus answers them because he is not afraid of uh, offending legalistic Pharisees. Look at verse 12. Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And Jesus answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said, Explain this parable to us. And he said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whoever... Whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Jesus uses and the expression here, the blind leading the blind. Um, and he does that to point out that spiritual blindness, not understanding that it's what comes out of the heart rather than what we do about washing our hands or cleansing our pots and pans. When we, when we are blind to the truth that sin is harbored into our heart, there are dire consequences. When leaders are caught up in legalism instead of being concerned about real sin in the hearts of the people, what happens? Everyone ends up in the pit. Everyone ends up in the pit. I hope you hear Jesus' words again here. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid because... Jesus is the step son of God. And when we believe that he's the son of God, we get to step not just out of the boat like Peter did, but we get to step out of the great cruise ship of legalism, out of the trap of legalism and rituals, and we can let go. We can let go because Jesus is the son of God of all um, religious correctness and um, legalistic appearances can't we and we can step into grace we get to step into grace because of who Jesus is look at Ephesians 2 8 and 9 on your verse sheet for by grace you have been saved through faith this is not of your own doing it is the gift of God not the results of works so that no one can boast that's a great gift that Jesus gives us because he is the son of God and we can live in the truth that it's the motives and attitudes of the heart that truly matter to God. By his grace and by the blood of the Son of God, we are saved from legalism. Now, following his dust up here with the Pharisees, that didn't really bother him, but apparently bothered the 
the disciples a little bit, Jesus moves away from the controversy that has surrounded him and his teaching, and he withdraws uh, to the coast of the Mediterranean. He goes northeast up to the cities of Tyre and Sidon, which happens to be a Gentile area. Now he's doing it to escape the crowds, and he's trying to escape the controversy, but unfortunately, in this Gentile region, the controversy follows him. Now he's just taught this new truth to the disciples that they are not going to be made unclean by the foods they eat. If you remember um, our study in Acts, you know that Peter went into a great deal uh, about that in Acts 10. Um, and this blows away centuries of traditions and rituals about food restrictions for the nation of Israel. He's already walked through that controversy, and now he's headed among the Gentiles, who were also considered unclean by the nation of Israel. And his first encounter in this Gentile region is with an incredible Canaanite woman. Look at verse 22 in your chapter 15. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So the disciples are pretty irritated that this woman is following them. And she's not just following them, which they don't like that anyway. But she's crying out and making what they think is a nuisance of herself. And they just, I think, decide, okay, Jesus, just heal her. And she'll go away and leave us alone. But he does an interesting thing here. For a while, he simply ignores her. And I think they're confused about that. Now, some scholars think that Matthew writes about Jesus' delay here, that he includes it in the narrative, because Matthew's gospel was written to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. And Jesus' delay gives him an opportunity to point out here in his writings that um, he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, even though this mom is a Gentile, she clearly knows who he is. She calls out Lord, and she uses Son of David, which is his messianic title. And then she kneels and begs for his help. Um, I've always thought, when I've read this before, that his reply to her was a little bit callous. A little bit callous. But when you really look closely, what he's really doing is just stating the truth. He's just stating the truth. The nation of Israel is God's chosen people, and he has sent the bread of life first to his children, these precious people that he has raised up from Abraham and carried throughout the centuries. They are his children. They are the ones that are going to sit at the master's table and eat the bread that he sent straight into their lives. The bread wasn't intended first for the Gentiles that the Jewish people callously call dogs here. But this Gentile woman, I wish we knew more about her. I wish we could invite her up here and talk to her a little bit because I think she's an amazing gal. She's brave and articulate and persistent. And she reminds Jesus, God has enough for everyone. God has enough for everyone. The bread may be on the table for the children but even the crumbs at God's table are blessings that change lives. I've had that in my life, thinking, I just need a little crumb, Lord. And then he gives me over and above anything I could possibly want. And Jesus does the same thing for the Gentile mom here that he did for the Gentile centurion that we studied a couple of weeks ago. He heals her daughter based on her faith, not on her ancestry, not on her inclusion in the covenant that God has made with the nation of Israel. Look at Matthew 8 on your verse sheet. 
When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. Nowhere in Israel had Jesus seen faith like this woman that just wanted the crumbs from the master's table of the centurion that believed he could simply say it and it would be done. And you know what both of these stories are? They are the foreshadowing of the day when the Gentiles will become part of God's kingdom by faith in Christ alone. We also see the Lord's blessing here on Gentiles as Jesus repeats his incredible miracle of feeding thousands from loaves and fishes. And this is a separate incident from the feeding of the 5,000. They're not just retold in a different way. Jesus is on a mountain um, in East Galilee and he stops to rest. But once again, he's swarmed by a crowd. And this time it's a Gentile crowd, which is a little bit unusual and proves how famous he has become. And for three days, he patiently and selfishly teaches and heals these Gentiles. But at the end of three days, it's Jesus this time that's worried about where in the world are these people going to get something to eat. Look at verse 32 in Matthew 15 with me. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we going to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few small fishes and directing the crowd to sit down on the ground he took the seven loaves and fish and having given thanks he broke them gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied and they took up seven basketfuls of broken pieces left over you know, it was curious to me that the disciples did not anticipate what was going to happen here. You would think they would have already gone around and counted up and said, well, we have this many loaves and this many fishes because, you know, Jesus is going to bless it. But it's possible that the reason they don't think that the miracle is going to happen here is because this was a Gentile crowd. And they don't anticipate that Jesus will perform the same miracle for the Gentiles and feeding them that he has done for the nation of Israel. In the first miracle, Jesus provides for his people Israel. But this miracle reveals the truth that God's blessing and favor will fall outside of the lost sheep of Israel. Look at John 10, 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. One flock and one shepherd. And that's what we see when we compare these two miracles. The other thing that we see if we compare these two miracles is... um, that there were 12 baskets left over after feeding the 5,000, and there were seven baskets left over after feeding the 4,000 Gentiles. Now, there are some theologians that believe this is great symbolism, and they believe that the 12 baskets may represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and that the seven baskets are symbolic because seven is the perfect number of completion in the scriptures. Um, the inference they're making here as they talk about that symbolism is that the kingdom will be perfect and complete with the inclusion of the Gentiles eventually. Now, that symbolism is interesting to contemplate, and honestly, we don't know whether that is the truth, if that was God's symbolism or not. But what we do know, there is something we do know for certain, and that is that Jesus has compassion on the Gentiles who follow him in faith and beg for his mercy Regardless of who we are, Gentile or Jew, Jesus responds with our true faith, whoever we are and wherever we are, with divine favor. And his words to us, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid, share the truth of who he is, whoever we are and wherever we are. And when we recognize who he is and believe in his words, we can live with that courage and that confidence, and that comfort, 
because we know he is the Son of God. Look at John 16, 33 on your verse sheet. I have said these things to you that in me you have, may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus is the Son of God. Pray with me. Father, you're a great and a gracious God and your words of truth um, speak to all of our hearts. Father, I pray that you would give us um, your grace and your mercy as your sheep, that you would feed us, that you would provide for us, that you would um, allow us to know the truth that you, um, our Lord Jesus, is the Son of God and that we can take heart and not be afraid. I pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks, ladies.